at this point in his thought, or at least I think what we can say at this point in seminar 18, his thoughts on women are quite a bit less developed, at least on my read, or, or at least he's, he's less plainly stated around how he's understanding feminine subjectivities in chapter 8 of seminar 18. He does, however, hit us with one of the two basic formulas for feminine subjectivity that he's going to later develop. You see it in chapter 8. It's on page 17 or 151 in the PDF. It's this wild thing where you've got backwards capital EX with a line over it, meaning negation, next to the figure of the phallic function, again with a line over it. How are we to understand this? Well, if you read this thing literally to the letter, here's what you can say about this pure writing. Literally, there is not one woman who is not defined by the phallic function, namely by castration. That's what the line above the EX says. The backwards EX says there is not one woman. There is not some woman who is not defined by the phallic function. Now, I don't find those double negatives very helpful, but there's a reason why Lacan is stating it that way. Lacan has to state it that way to keep this from passing fully into the field of the symbolic. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. But right now, I think what we can say is there's a better way, a more clarifying way to make sense of this formula for feminine subjectivities that he is hitting us with at the end of chapter 8. Here's how I read it. Here's the bumper sticker for this particular formulation. Look far and near, as hard as you like, but you'll never find a woman who isn't at least partially defined by the phallic function. This is how I read this formula. Look wherever you want. Interview all the women in the, in the primordial father's horde of women. Interview them all, and you'll never find one who isn't at least partially defined by the phallic function. Now, here's a part that I just find ridiculous. And it kind of makes me not even want to talk about this shit anymore. But So you're telling me that we have a father of the primal horde. And this father is the one who escapes the totalizing count of castrated men and all this bullshit. Okay, got it, got it. Uh, but there's no mother of the primal horde. Now, maybe you're going to say, well, that's because it's all the mommies. All the mommies are the mother of the blah, blah, blah. But I think it's very revealing here and kind of ridiculous if you think about this, that there's one daddy for everybody in this myth, but there's not one mommy that would have gotten all the other women you know, birthed into this world. In other words, why is there a father of the primal horde, but not a mother of the primal horde? And maybe the answer is numerical and obvious. I think that's one way to read this, but I find it just ridiculous here, this dilemma that there is not one woman who isn't at least partially defined by the phallic function. You see how we're reading this? You catching this? The father of the primal horde is the one man who escapes castration, who is not even partially castrated. And what Lacan is here suggesting is that there is no equivalent to that in the field of feminine subjectivity. There is no woman who has escaped fully the castrative logic that we see in the phallic function here, represented by this I with a circle in it and then X beside it. There is not one woman who isn't, to some extent, subject to castration. We have one man who isn't, but there's not one woman who isn't. That's the part that I find kind of ridiculous here. Lacan might need to meet a few more women. He doesn't get much further than this in chapter 8, and I'm kind of glad he doesn't because, you know, like I said, it's kind of frustrating for me as the father of a daughter whom I hope grows into a certain uh, type of woman uh, to hear this stuff, to read this stuff. Um, logically, I get it. 
but there's something about how he's working this that I don't quite buy. I think there's a bit of bullshit happening here. Now, maybe I'll be proved wrong. Maybe by the end of 18, I'll be on board. Maybe as we get to seminar 19, maybe as we get to seminar 20, illustrious seminar 20, I'll finally be convinced. Logically, I see what he's up to. Existentially, I'm not buying it yet. So I'm glad that he doesn't get much further with his theory of feminine subjectivity here in chapter 8. He does, however, allude to something else. He hints at something and this something that he hints at, I believe, is the second formula of subjectivity that he would later go on to develop. This is the one that I'm holding up to you now. You have your upside down A next to X with a line over the top of it, which negates the universal claim, all women. There is not all women. And then you have the paternal phallic function next to it, the castrative logical no of the father. And the way I read this formula, that's not mentioned in eight, although I think he's hinting at it, is that not every part of every woman is wholly defined by the phallic function. So all women are partially defined by the phallic function, but there's no woman who is wholly part wholly defined by the phallic function. Not every part of every woman is wholly defined by the phallic function. Now, what happens when we add these two formulas together? The one he presents us with and the one he alludes to. I think when you add these two together, you have a fairly clear, coherent, and accessible statement on feminine subjectivity, at least to get the conversation going. And let's be very, very pointed about this. I think this is where the conversation begins. What eventually arrives in Seminar 20 is getting started here in Seminar 18, masculine and feminine subjectivities as formulated in the field of pure writing by what I've been holding up to you in the form of these upside down and reverse letters. Sticking with the two formulas for feminine subjectivity, here's how I think it stacks up. If we could put a bumper sticker to this, it would sound like follows. All women are at least partially defined by the phallic function, but no one woman is wholly defined by the phallic function. So you can look near and far, and you will not find a woman who is not at least partially defined by the phallic function. But here's the thing, you can also look near and far. You can interview all the mommies and you will not find one of them who is wholly defined by the phallic function. All men are wholly defined by the phallic function, except one. There is no woman, however, who is wholly defined by the phallic function. That's how I'm reading these two formulas together. All women are a little bit to some extent, defined by the phallic function, maybe to a lot extent defined by the phallic function. But no woman, no one who occupies the position of feminine subjectivity for Lacan is wholly and completely defined by the phallic function the way men are. Notice how this stacks up as we bring men and women together, which doesn't constitute a sexual rapport, by the way. For men, there's always someone beyond phallic jouissance. We know who that someone is. This uncut daddy who's out there with his uncut daddy dick enjoying all of the women. For women, there's always something beyond phallic jouissance. That's the important thing here. For men, there's always some one beyond the phallic jouissance to which they are subjected. For women, there's always something more to their sexuality than phallic jouissance. There is something more to feminine subjectivity than phallic jouissance can account for. Women are not just castrated. What we see here, what I think Lacan is alluding to in this something beyond phallic jouissance is an unnamed, fiercely ulterior, 
an utterly real point of access that you know how he's going to describe later. He's going to call it an other jouissance. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but I think we're right on the edge here. My question would be, which edge? Which tidal zone do we now find ourselves in as we're thinking through this unnameable, wildly ulterior, utterly real point of access to a type of jouissance that is not phallic, but something else, something else entirely. It's a great place for us to pause.